So in this clip, we're going to move from the isolated tetrahedrosilicates to the chain silicates. We'll start by drawing a representation of the single chain structure. So the deal here is the tetrahedra are going to link together to form a chain. So with the single chains, we're going to start by drawing our basic symbol representing an individual silica tetrahedron and then we're gonna just start linking them together. I'm sure you can draw them more neatly than I can, but hopefully you'll get the idea of what we're trying to show here. Oops, see, I mean, I'm sure you can draw better than I can. Let's try to hook one more on to the chain here. Okay, so that's a single chain, a chain of silica tetrahedra. And you know, it can continue on in this dimension within the mineral. So let's see what's happening within the chain. Uh, remember that each of the building blocks or tetrahedra contains one silicon inside and four oxygens. Uh, each of those four oxygens is at the corner of the tetrahedra and then there's one up above the plane of the screen. And each of those oxygens is getting an electron from the silicon inside the tetrahedron. Now, a little bit different from the isolated tetrahedra is that at this location here, to put a circle there and then at this location here okay at each of those two locations there's just one oxygen that's shared between two adjacent tetrahedra this oxygen over here it's shared between these two tetrahedra and so let's think about this oxygen it's getting one electron from the silicon inside this tetrahedron it's getting the second electron that it wants from the silicon that's inside the adjoining tetrahedron, so it's completely satisfied. It doesn't have to bond to anything else. Same goes for this oxygen here that's shared between the two tetrahedra. It doesn't have to bond with anything else to uh, satisfy its need for two electrons. Now, uh, down here, the, we have oxygens that do need to bond to something else because the oxygen here, for example, it's getting one electron from the silicon inside the tetrahedron, but it needs another one. So we're going to have bridging cations like the magnesium Mg2 plus ion and the iron, the Fe2 plus ion that we saw in the olivine structure. We're going to have those same kinds of uh, cations serving as bridging cations in the single chain silicates except now they're bridging the gap between two chains of silica tetrahedra so this magnesium mg2 plus means it wants to give away two electrons and so it gives one electron to the oxygen and this tetrahedron is up above but there's another tetrahedron down here it's going to give its second electron to the oxygen at this location in this tetrahedron. And that tetrahedron is part of another single chain. So, all right, now we're going to draw as neat as we can, as neatly as possible, this uh, second chain of silica tetrahedra. It's another single chain. And right, these other cations, they serve as a bridge, linking the two chains together. When we think about the bonding, the bonding within the silica tetrahedron, between the silicon and the oxygens in the tetrahedron. It's very strong bonding. It's what 
something you can call partly covalent bonding. Very strong type of bond within the chain. These bonds between the bridging cations and oxygens in the tetrahedra, they're weaker. They're purely ionic bonds typically. So a uh, weaker form of bonding between these bridging cations and the oxygens in the chains, stronger bonds within the single chain uh, of tetrahedra. Now that means that minerals that have this single chain structure are going to have a nice smooth breakage plane or what we call mineral cleavage parallel to this zone in the mineral where these bridging cations with their weak bonds are all lined up. Cleavage in minerals actually corresponds to a zone of weak bonding within the minerals. Now, we have to remember in drawing these structures that we're trying to represent something that's three-dimensional on a two-dimensional piece of paper or a computer screen. So, remember this position here or this one here? That represents an oxygen that's up above the plane of the screen. And that oxygen is not shared with another tetrahedron. Instead, it's bonded with one of those weak ionic bonds to a bridging cation up above the plane of the screen. And so there'll be a whole lineup, a whole plane, if you will, of bridging cations up above these tetrahedra. And they're going to serve as bridges that link the chain that we drew to another chain that's even farther up above the plane of the screen, the plane of the computer screen or your paper if you're drawing these, and I hope you are. So this uh, single chain mineral structure is going to have two directions of cleavage, two directions of cleavage. One that we can see here parallel to these weak uh, bridging cation bonds, and the second direction is going to be basically parallel to the screen where we have the other zone of bridging cations all lined up. Now we need to put down an example mineral, an example mineral that has this single chain structure, and that's the mineral pyroxene. It's actually a group of minerals, but okay, we'll just call it pyroxene for now. Okay, so pyroxene is a single chain silicate, and do you think it's a mafic silicate? I hope you said yes, because the pyroxene mineral has this kind of composition. It has magnesium, iron, and silicon and oxygen. Because it has both magnesium and iron, it's a mafic silicate. Okay, it's got the single chain structure we can note. Some of the uh, chain silicates can have other uh, ions like uh, calcium, for example, in the uh, cation positions that we've drawn here, like for the iron and the magnesium. But uh, uh, let's go on next to draw the double chain structure. So I'm going to erase this. And next we're going to draw the double chain, double chain structure. And we'll do that by initially drawing a single chain. And I think just to save time, I'm not going to put those little those three little lines inside. <laughs> right, so I'm leaving out these three little lines that we had before. That's a single chain, and a double chain is going to have another single chain linked directly up to the one that we already drew. It's hard to draw neatly <laughs> on the computer here. Okay, and this double chain structure, you know, will build in this direction in the mineral. So, right, you have the same kind of thing going on. That's a shared oxygen there. It's completely satisfied. doesn't have to bond to anything else. Very strong bonds within the double chain. Even stronger because there's a double amount or thickness, I guess you could say, of 
the strongly bonded silica tetrahedral building blocks in the double chain silicates compared to the single chain silicates. But we have oxygens here, here, and here, you know, parallel to the chains again, where we're going to have the bridging cations. Same kinds of things, but actually in these minerals, the double chains, you can have even more variety of bridging cations like some calcium and some sodium, for example. Okay, now, so, oh, I wasn't going to draw all those little lines. But I am going to draw another double chain. I hope it fits in the screen. Let's try to make it fit. Okay. So it's the same basic, it's very similar to the single chain structure, it's still a chain silicate. But instead of single chain as tetrahedra, it's a double, double wide kind of situation with the double chain silicates. Now, cleavage wise, again, we have these weakly, you know, the ionic bonds between the bridging cations and the linking together the double chains. So this is a zone of weak bonding in the mineral. It's going to be a cleavage direction. Just like the single chain silicates, up above the screen we have another plane where there's oxygens that need to bond to a bridging cation. So uh, our example mineral, which is the amphibole group of minerals, they're also going to have two directions of cleavage. And they're also mafic silicates. They're going to be dark in color because of the magnesium and iron content in the mineral's chemical composition. Now, let me show you a picture. The picture is actually of an amphibole, a type of amphibole mineral called hornblende. And let me see if I can find that picture. Okay, so here's the picture of amphibole mineral. And again, it's one of the samples that we have in the lab that you'll be looking at in the minerals lab. So notice, first of all, it's very dark in color. Um, amphibole tends to be uh, dark green to black in color. And it has two directions of cleavage, but not at a 90 degree angle. Those two cleavage directions don't meet at a 90 degree angle. It's more like 60 and 120 degrees. And it's hard to see. It's hard to see the cleavage a lot of times in amphibole mineral. We uh, remember amphibole is a double chain silicate. And we said that the single chain silicate pyroxene group of minerals also has the two directions of cleavage, but in pyroxene, the cleavages are at 90 degrees. Those two cleavage directions come together at a right angle. But it can be hard to see the cleavage in the pyroxene too, and I don't have a picture of it here to show you, but you'll see in lab. Pyroxene has the same basic color, uh, dark green, often black in color. So it can be really difficult to tell pyroxene and amphibole apart in a hand sample.